Um, yeah, so I'm Guilty Gilza. I co-founded Topology with Ken Ho Kim. We're Gigi and KK. You can call me Guilty or Gilza or Gigi. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about our uh, game design philosophies that we have identified by April 2022. It's uh, fast evolving. First one is we think it's important to develop real depth on chain. Um, you know, game industries have been building software artifacts to provide entertainment values, and those software artifacts are temporal. They're not designed to live for 100 years or 200 years. But in, on the blockchain, the stuff we build are immutable, and we want them to be the infrastructure that are powering the future. Right? So it's important to build things with immutability and longevity in mind, and it's also important to think about real depth. Real depth here means that, for example, as Justin said, the physics in this reality is supremely sophisticated and consistent. You know, as opposed to, you look at various distribution functions in games. They may use stuff like Perlin noise generation, all that stuff. Perlin noise generation is something that I call a shallow complexity. You can't really dig deeper than that. You, know, you, you hit a wall in terms of the literal algorithm that describes the complexity. Right? There's nothing behind that anymore. But when you, th when, you, when you think about things that are distributed in this world as observed by the, the, the human observers, right? There's always sophisticated rules that are beneath it that actually manifests itself as an observed state for the human beings. So real depth means that we need to build worlds with sophisticated rule sets, physics, metaphysics, etc., that are powering those worlds and the mechanics. And I'm attaching two links here. One link is by Max Hodak. Um, he talked about um, physics consideration and simulated realities. That's a very inspiring essay. The other essay is by me. I wrote about how provable computation can provide the, the, the potential of decentralizing the patent office practice, but that may not be so relevant to the game design um, topic here, so I'll skip that. Um, Second mental model or design philosophy we have is that it needs to have multi ingress. It needs to be it needs to be designed with inclusivity in mind. And what that means is that when we talk about metaverse, it's something. It's a world where people with different backgrounds, interests, and talents can come and express themselves and find recognition and find ownership and find rewards, right? And so when you look at, for example, Counter Strike, right, it basically favors people with fast muscle coordination with fast technical thinking. Um, it doesn't favor people from other backgrounds at all. And if you want to contribute to the arts of the Counter-Strike game, you can mod it or you can join Valve and help evolve the game, but there's less and few ways to really participate in that game from a diverse talent perspective. Right? So I think the metaverse that we want to build or these on-chain worlds where people can participate in, they have to be designed such that people can come in and participate and create from different directions, with different talents and intentions. <clears throat> uh, right, so permissionless expansion of game boundary, that's another design philosophy that we strive for. That basically means that us as game developer is not the bottleneck of the game. Right? The boundary can be co-expanded by the players as a game that we're just providing a seed to the world, after which it's up to the players to expand them. And this is a really hard problem. This is not just a philosophical problem. This is also a highly technical problem. Various games have provided no-code platforms or APIs or scripting platforms for you to contribute mods and contribute additional content to the game. But on the blockchain, we have a consistent computing medium. So we can potentially achieve much greater interoperability and composability on the blockchain. And that allows players Basically, that allows us to not call people user anymore. They're not just using it, right? They're creating it for you, with you. They're, they're changing it. We can call them citizens of the world, just like we, the developers, are seeding that world. Just, just they're doing a little bit of work up front, and then it's up to all the citizens to expand it. And uh, finally, we think that we need to design from a very non skeuomorphic perspective. I think one of the mental models I have is um, what layer one does to the financial industry is what layer two and onward, higher, up, um, higher layers will do to the game industry. And that means that a lot of the things need to be, re a lot of the things need to be rediscovered and rebuilt 
from scratch in a more, much more elegant way, much more composable ways. A lot of the games that are built in the game industry, they don't consider composability upfront. The programming model, the data structure they use, the, the, the proprietiness of the game engine, etc. they all surround, um, they do not support composability and interoperability from the beginning. And so we need to rebuild a lot of things, but we, we can do it much more elegantly this time. So today, um, Topology uh, wants to present a, an experimental game. We think that it's, it's just like how the game industry, industry started. Um, there are concrete games that come back and drive infrastructure changes, that come back and drive the underlying technology. So we think it's important to push at the application level, and then we can identify what we need to do on the infrastructure level. So this experimental launching game on StarkNet, the motivation is uh, last October, I think last October, I did some physics simulation on StarkNet, and um, it was basically a, a very simplified 2D um, three three body problem uh, plus a planet. It's like a constrained four body problem, and basically you run physics simulation on the blockchain or on StarkNet to be specific. That means that you're simulating physics using this um, you know, finite approximation, stepping through time to simulate the dynamics of various you know, cel celestial bodies that are re revolving around each other. And I'm a very big fan of the three-body problem author, Lo Cixin, and I, I read a lot of his novels, and I was thinking maybe I can make a game out of the three-body problem. Um, and so that's the motivation of this game. This game is called Isaac. It's, it's very experimental game concept. And essentially, it is built around the three-body problem. Problem. Um, dog forest builds around the dog forest problem. Uh, the three-body problem at its core really is you live in a solar system where there are three suns, and it's a very hostile environment, right? Because if there are three suns, then it's extremely chaotic. You're not revolving on an elliptic curve. You are doing this very unpredictable um, um, uh, uh, trajectory in the solar system. And at any time, if you crash into a sun, the entire planet decimates, right? So it's a very hostile um, environment to live in. And that's why it makes it fun, because it's a very challenging environment to live in. And I'm, uh, we're um, compounding that game with Factorial. Factorial is another 10,000-hour game that asks players to build factory pipelines to transform resources into various um, uh, factories and devices that eventually players build a rocket and escape the game. Right, so what is this game? This game is, can be understood as a combination of the three-body problem and the factorial game. So Isaac is a massive co-op game with uh, the physical and metaphysical rules enforced uh, on StarkNet in, in small contracts, where players essentially play the factorial game on the surface of the planet together so that they can direct their fate of their planet in the three-body problem. And what that means is, um, first of all, players build factory pipelines and power grids, and they're supposed to transform natural resources distributed on the planet into something ultimately called um, nuclear driller and propulsion engine. And so what, what is nuclear driller and propulsion engine? It's a conceptual device that drills down Earth and pushes the matter upward with nuclear power in order to give the planet a reverse momentum kick. And once you can do that, right, you can essentially push your planet into different orbits. So that's the goal of the game, is players work together to build these nuclear engines, to drill their Earth and push their planet in order to change orbit. And why do they want to change orbit? Because if the planet crashes into a sun, then everyone dies. So it's like everyone wins or everyone dies situation. Players have to work together to optimize their resource throughput and time the launch of their engine. The, the, I think the caveat here is we need to remember that the planets are revolving around three suns, and so the, tra the tra trajectory is quite unpredictable. It's a chaotic system by default. And uh, the planet also rotates. It's, it's rotated around itself. And so players really need to time the deployment and the launch of their rocket engines to really push their planet to the right orbit to either dodge a sun, or if you can push your planet hard enough, you can escape the solar system, if you can reach escape velocity. Right? And that basically characterizes a win, like every player wins at the same time. Um, I, I don't think I can sh uh, switch my screen here because of some constraints, so I'll, st I'll just stick to a uh, screenshot. So this is, uh, if you can go to that website, it is an experimental front end 
that looks and visualizes the solar system states that are recorded and enforced on a darkness mode contract. Right, so you have three suns and a planet, and the arrows indicate their velocity vectors. And this is another client that looks at the micro scale at the surface of the planet, where you know people can build, players can build various devices and pipelines that either transport resources or transmit energies. And so we have, uh, you know, the the yellow square here is a factory, and. The, the, the pink square here is the nuclear power generators, right? So if you're powering the factory with nuclear power, it, you're supposed to increase the production rate at the factory. So it becomes a trade-off game. When are you going, going to build more power generators to boost your production rate at the factory? But when you build power generators, generators you will be, uh, the opportunity cost will be you cannot build devices, you cannot do other uh, utilities. Right? So it's constant, constantly an optimization and a trade-off problem. Uh, some of the features about this game is um, information and symmetry is kind of redefined. I play a lot of games antagonistic in nature, and I think that it, it's kind of unexplored for game mechanics to be hugely, uh, hugely cooperative. As in, in this game, every player wins at the same time or loses at the same time. So there is an asymmetry between all the players together on one side and a noun on the other side. A noun basically means where will our planet, our planet be tomorrow? And the reason why that is announced is because it's a chaotic system. So players are working together to, to figure out the probability of different scenarios and, and to optimize their decision making. Right? Uh, another feature is obviously on-chain physics simulation. The well, question is, why do we want to do physics on-chain at all? Right? As Justin just said, we are building worlds that have autonomy. And that basically means that game developers are not God. And when game developers are not God, then the game itself, the game world itself, needs to, auto, needs to enforce the rules. It needs to regulate itself. And, um, and so if there are physics that are regulating the dynamics of this world, that physics needs to be enforced in a smart contract. And that, so that's why we're running uh, physics simulation in a smart contract. If you look at the code a little bit, there's RK4. That's essentially the um, out-of-the-box uh, integrator, Runge-Kutta fourth order, that's able to achieve quite satisfactory uh, accuracy when it comes to um, uh, low-complexity physics simulation problems. All right, chaotic system, right? So if, if, if this is not a trisolar system, if it's just one sign and one planet, then it's way less fun, right? Because it's a, it's a perfect, um, you know, a Kepler problem, a planet can't crash into the sun. But if we have three suns, then the problems suddenly become very interesting because you cannot predict arbitrarily long into the future because of the chaoticness of the system. Now, the question here is, well, if everything is in a small contract, can I just take the contract off chain and just run it deterministically? And I can predict everything that can happen in the future. Right, so in order to counter that, we're injecting randomness into the state transitions, and that randomness is derived from player actions. And so you can't really predict long enough in the future because randomness are injecting along the way and that randomness is determined in the future by what players will do in the future. And this is obviously inspired by the fiat Shamir where you know, in zero-knowledge proof domain, uh, they use this to turn non -interactive, uh, interactive algorithms into non-interactive um, algorithms. Another feature is assembly line and power grid. Right? So there's assembly line and power grid people, players have to build together to optimize throughput. And, to, um, and they have to cooperate on a civilization level, as in every player is on the same planet need to co cooperate together. Multi-ingress is satisfied in this game, right? So people that love to do circuit layout problem, they come to this game, they can find satisfaction. People that love to think about throughput optimizations, making factories that, that are um, optimized, they can come to this game. People that love to think about orbital mechanics, you know, NASA fans, um, aer aerospace fans, they can come to this game. People love to do politics and just coordination problems. They can come to this game because player has to work together, and so someone needs to mediate the community, right? And finally, just like Dog Forest Pioneer, this game is client agnostic. So everyone can build clients. Uh, we spun up three websites just to look and interact with the with the same game contract. But anyone can build their own client, web based, terminal based, whatever. So it's ultimately a client building problem. Determine how you want to interact with the contract. Uh, a couple of things here. The, the world itself is evaluated in an eager um, um, 
uh, fashion, I think dark forest is, is forwarded by a sort of a lazy evaluation mechanism. Uh, this world is forwarded by the eager evaluation. And the reason we can do that is because we have Yagi. Yagi is like a keeper, but on StarkNet. Keeper is this automation mechanism on Ethereum. We have Yagi on StarkNet, and it's um, just a third party bots coming in and fulfilling tasks and calling, calling small contract functions. Um, finally, we're still designing the civilization reset procedures. So that basically means that when a planet crashes into a sun, we want to reset the civilization, maybe put the planet in a random place and just start all over. This is essentially mirroring the, the original three-body problem novel, where their world just gets destroyed over and over, and they have to be smarter somehow over and, um, um, over, across um, generations. And we can run parallel universes, right? So instead of running just one canonical universe, we can launch like 10,000 different um, Isaac instances where people can join different lobbies and play together and figure out how they can optimize the longevity of their civilization. So finally, we'll end this um, talk about topology. We're a company. Our mission is to combine state-of-the-art zero-knowledge proof system research and world-class creative engineering talent because we want to build on-chain worlds with rich gameplay and composability and interoperability. This is a very, this is a multidisciplinary challenge that goes across theory and creative art and engineering. So um, anyone interested would love to talk to you. Thank you.